Welcome to Boswell Book Company. It is day 4,563 of us being in business. And I mentioned a few upcoming events, but they all pale in comparison with tonight's event. We are so honored to be hosting, along with Family of Four Parishes, um, John M. Sweeney, the author of Feed the Wolf, Befriending Our Fears in the Way of St. Francis. Tonight, we'll be, um, Mr. Sweeney will be in conversation with Adam Bucko. Um, Adam is a uh, fiscal priest and co-founder and director of the Center for Spiritual Imagination. He's the author of several books, including The New Monasticism, A Manifesto for Contemplation, See, this is one of those things, contemplative living. And I hope I said that right. And I apologize to everyone if I said it wrong. Uh, John Sweetie is the author of numerous books, including The Complete Francis of Assisi, and is considered to be the authoritative voice on the life and spiritu spirituality of St. Francis. His other books include Nicholas Black Elk, Medicine Man, Catechist Saint, Thomas Merton, An Introduction to His Life, Teachings and Practices, the complete St. Francis of Assisi, which I mentioned, the St. Francis of Assisi prayer book. He's the editor of A Course in Christian Mysticism. He writes regularly for America and the tablet and is the publisher and editor-in-chief of Paraclete Press. What an honor to have you both here tonight. Thank you for joining us. Welcome to Boswell's virtual event series. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, yeah, thank you so much. It's a joy to be here with uh, you, John and with everyone here. So John, in terms of our conversation, um, I have a couple of basic questions about you and St. Francis. And once we get through that, maybe we could get into some of the specific practices from this new wonderful book that just came out that you wrote. Uh, so my first question for you is, we all know that you've written several books on St. Francis. Uh, why yet another book about St. Francis? <laughs> this saint that, uh, you know, is probably the most popular saint in the world, but also this saint that is oftentimes kind of dismissed. And a quote that comes to mind is from Dorothy Day, who said, don't make me a saint because I don't want to be dismissed so easily. And I feel like we kind of deodorized St. Francis. So anyway... Why did you write yet another book on this medieval man? So you want me to apologize right at the beginning? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and at the beginning of my book, I do sort of apologize and say, okay, why does the world need yet another book on St. Francis? And I have suggested um, to, to friends and also in a couple of talks I've given that this is perhaps the last book I'll write about him and on him, because it does get to be a little ridiculous after a while. Does the world really need more books about St. Francis? But at the same time, I think there's this way in which I can't shake him. Um, I sort of fell, fell in, fell in love with Francis when I was a teenager and thought that if I was going to be on some path that is called Christian, then it has to have something to do with the Franciscan way. And I wanted to understand what that meant. And I wanted to figure that out in my life. So this book is perhaps the last one I'll write about him, it, it, certainly for a while. But I wanted to write it because I thought that for, uh, for the first time, more than ever before, I was bringing Franciscan spirituality and practices and ways and thought and and ideas into the 21st century in a way that I hadn't before. I, I've written biographies of Francis. I've written books about Francis's troubles. I've written books about Francis's prayers. I've written, I wrote a book about Francis and Claire together and what's that, what that's all about. Um, that's I, my favorite of your books in St. Francis. Is it? Yeah. Well, um, in, uh, in fact, I, I was giving a couple of talks earlier this week um, on some of the material, some of the ideas in this new book. And I had, I had this uh, wonderful woman come up to me at the end of one of them and say, you haven't even mentioned Claire. What's, and, I, and I had to apologize. I really hadn't even mentioned Claire. So then I tried to sort of throw in a couple mentions of Claire uh, later on. But in this book, it is true. I don't, I don't talk a whole lot about Claire. It really is about Francis. He was such an enigmatic figure a fascinating person, a countercultural figure, uh, 
um, a guy who we still haven't caught up to in some regards. And so I just keep, you know, I can't shake him. Great. And so, John, you just mentioned that when you discovered Francis and at the beginning of the book, you kind of describe the history of different publications and getting to the real Francis of, of who he really was. Um, what was so important about him for you? Well, back then, what was so important about him for me was that I discovered him when I was 16. Mm -hmm. And Francis had an interesting, tr somewhat troubled relationship at home uh, with his parents and in his community. And he went through some dramatic changes of who he was and discovery of who he was. Um, he had a flair, he had a dramatic flair about him. And so some of these dramatic things that he discovered about himself were played out in front of people, um, the whole town at times. Now that doesn't really describe me at 16, but at 16, uh, his life and his experience and sort of witness uh, in the world kind of struck me deep. Um, you know, I was a pretty typical 16 year old in that I was consumed with myself. You know, I, I worried about all the things that 16 year olds worry about, but they're, they're the sorts of things that I also realized were kind of self, self absorbed and I wanted a much more meaningful life when mm -hmm. I discovered that there were people like Francis out there. Um, so that's what happened then. Mm -hmm. There's a way in which, you know, I still feel like he's sort of dragging me along now because mm -hmm. I keep feeling challenged by Francis's life. I don't feel challenged by it now in the way that I did when I was 16, which was I, I felt challenged to be to become authentic instead mm -hmm. of trying to be something else, because I was all, I was really trying to be something else. I was trying to be liked or I was trying to be, you know, someone that, you know, the cute girl might want to date or, you know, I was trying to be something i wasn't figuring out who i was and what my work in the world was supposed to be um, but he's still kind of calling to me and uh challenging me and then and uh, this book is about a lot of that and what i love about this book is that really each chapter could be turned into a practice um and you begin with uh in in chapter one um, with essentially this idea that none of us are expected to walk alone and that we need to find our siblings. Uh, this was very meaningful to me. You know, I spent years working with homeless youth um, on the streets of New York City, and many of them were rejected by their families. And so our, as a result, part of their um, kind of work um, of healing was they had to reassemble their families. Uh, they had to find people who could travel with them, who could offer them support and etc. Uh, and in this first chapter, you kind of tell a story of Francis, you know, just taking off his clothes and, you know, this kind of a dramatic thing that he did. And then eventually assembling this, uh, this band of brothers. Uh, could you talk about that and, 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 and how it relates to our lives today in terms of us responding to that call that we may hear uh, after reading this book? Yeah, thank you. I, 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 I wanted to start it that way because that's how he started his life and his life meaning his converted life, his life of conversion. Um, once he got onto the path that he knew he was supposed to be on, he first had to find the people who were going to stand next to him mm -hmm. and decide who he was going to stand next to. And, you know, I feel like we've gone through a period in, in our history in the world and in this country in particular, perhaps over the last few years, where that has become more and more keen uh, and important for many of us to decide who are we gonna stand next to? Who are we going to stand with? Who are our siblings? So the language is metaphorical, but it's also literal. And Francis had to figure that out. I mean, you alluded at the beginning about 
the sort of hagiographical saccharine uh, traditions of the saints um, that people for very good reasons react against, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, I've, I've never written a book and I have no interest in writing a book about St. Francis the birdbath saint in the backyard. You know, that's, that's not the Francis who, who I am interested in and that's not a Francis who really existed anyway. Mm-hmm. But what I am interested in writing about and, and, and talking about is the Francis who had to choose his siblings because something at home was not quite right. Mm-hmm. Uh, we know that Francis had biological siblings, but that's all we know. We don't know anything about them, which means that something was not right at home. And um, we also know that one of the famous events that took place in his early life was after a a series of attempts to please his father in business, working side by side with him, putting on the fine armor that his dad bought for him so that he could try to be a knight or a crusader and he was a miserable failure at that. Um, after a bunch of these kinds of attempts, his father was, was furious with him. He felt disrespected because his son was nothing like him. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you don't get the sense that his father had any interest in understanding who Francis was. <clears throat> and so, yeah, he strips naked. It's actually one of three occasions in Francis's life, <laughs> kind of famous occasions of Francis's nudity uh, public nudity. So we could come back to that perhaps, but it, it, these are, these are some of the really interesting things about him, but yes, he stripped naked and it was a particular demonstration because his father was a, a tradesperson in silk and fine, uh, clothes and linens that had been, uh, dyed with some of the expensive dyes that you could, that you could get if you were traveling, uh, the routes that he would travel to and from marketplaces and so on. So the, the idea of taking off the fancy clothes, I mean, it wouldn't mean much for me because I don't have fancy clothes. And, you know, my wife will tell you I wear the same shirt every day, but it, he, he took off the fancy clothes, laid them at his father's feet and said, you know, I only have a father in heaven. So he chose his father also. He chose his siblings. He chose his father. And this is important stuff. Like every year, every year when Father's Day comes around, I go out of my way to tell people. If you have trouble on Father's Day, and we know that a lot of people have trouble on Father's Day for all sorts of reasons that we don't have to enumerate, Um, it's just obvious sometimes why Um, Father's Day can be a very painful and difficult time. And there were no happy Father's Days in, you know, the Bernadone uh, family between Pietro and Francis. There was a split and it was never healed. So so yeah, I, I wanted to begin with that sort of reality, that kind of gritty reality, because that's who Francis was. And I think that's a way in which he speaks to us today. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's just uh, beautiful. I, I was very touched by that chapter. Um, and, you know, kind of going back to those different practices or different chapters that you have there, um, in our contemporary spirituality, you know, we oftentimes talk about dramatic conversion stories and then people just kind of going in, adopting a spiritual practice, but also sometimes what happens if we don't have a proper psychological framework is that we engage in what some psychologists call a spiritual bypass, namely where we kind of over-spiritualize a lot of things and use that as an excuse to deal with certain realities that need healing both in us and outside in the world. And your second chapter talks about, you know, feeding the wolf. Um, And that is also the the title of the of the book. And, and, And there you have this Uh, quite wonderful uh, statement. You you, you say, Brother Wolf wasn't a saint. He was a damaged creature who was in need and who was hungry. Can you talk about that idea of feeding the wolf, both as a kind of metaphor for our inner work and facing some of our staff, but also in terms of how we show up in the world and how we relate to the world? What, what I think is important to 
uh, to, to ponder each of us is the way in which we are all wolves at one time or another. Mm -hmm. And the wolves that we pass without noticing or without uh, regard and the lack of compassion that we often have for people who are going through periods of time in their lives when they are wolves. And of course, I'm speaking metaphorically, but I'm also referring to what's very real in our lives. I mean, I, I think we could all pause and contemplate times when we have been wolves mm -hmm. and wolves that we have known. And it's the basic uh, sort of, you know, conceit idea of my book is that we feed the wolf because the wolf is hungry. And we should ask, why is the wolf hungry? And we should care, why is the wolf hungry? And we should, we should realize that our life is intricately connected to the wolf and that there are wolves all around us and that we are all wolves from one, you know, at one time or another. And, and that communities are based on these kinds of relationships and they get better when we heal relationships and when we connect with people. Um, so yeah, this is a lot of, this is a lot of what I talk about and I weave some of that through the book and, and the practices that, you know, that allow someone to feed the wolf and be willing to feed the wolf are things like vulnerability. Um, and there's ways in which we can practice vulnerability, um, and then gentleness, because there's a lot to be said about what Francis taught 800 years ago about gentleness and carefulness and loving kindness, and then courage. I think courage has a lot to do with it. And you know, the, the incident that feeding the wolf refers to um, in the life of Francis is a story called the Wolf of Gubbio. And it's, a, it's an instance where Francis was called to the town of Gubbio because he already had a bit of a reputation for sanctity and doing good things in the world. And they thought, you know, maybe this, this strange friar who seems to um, know what he's doing and seems to be a holy person could help us figure out how to handle this, this wolf that's rampaging the, you know, the village and the countryside and has eaten a couple of people and is scaring everybody to death. And so Francis comes and, you know, there's a variety of things that take place. And I, I, I talk about that a lot in the book. And I think courage has a great deal to do with it. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I mean, all, all of that is sort of woven through Feed the Wolf. And I think it has very much to do with how we live our lives. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In terms of the, you know, like Francis's own journey, you mentioned in the book that uh, Francis didn't want to become a monk like Benedictines uh, because being a Benedictine was essentially kind of, uh, you know, it was privileged living. Uh, one would be kind of hanging out in a fortress that protected uh, the monk from the world. Um, and oftentimes that was also connected to, you know, parents who had the money to send their boys to a monastery and etc. Uh, and then the life within the monastery was very ordered, safe, uh, you know, people would really be able to engage in, uh, you know, with precision in the liturgy, in, in really mastering how to do it in the right way. And Francis chose no protection from the world no safety. Um, he also avoided priesthood. Um, and this beautifully connects to what you just said, how, uh, you know, one of the ways that we can begin to approach the wolf is essentially by putting our weapons down, by disarming ourselves, disarming our hearts. Um, and yet when I look at, you know, the Franciscan order as you know, all orders stabilize. And now there are properties, now there are friaries or monasteries and etc. Uh, could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, 
uh, Francis's vow of poverty was extreme. Uh, it was extreme in a way that it doesn't resemble the way that a vow of poverty is lived in most any religious order today because he refused to think about tomorrow. Mm -hmm. you know, he took those teachings of Jesus in, you know, in the Gospels, literally. I mean, that's, that's one of the things that people often say about Francis is that he might be the only one who, well, he's not the only one, but he's one of the few who really did that. You know, I mean, you, you, you know better than I do, you know, about Mahatma Gandhi. And, you know, Gandhi, of course, famously read the New Testament when he was a student in London and said, um, I actually would become a Christian because of reading this if I ever actually met someone who, who followed this. Mm -hmm. um, because he was talking about the kinds of practices and he was a fan mm -hmm. of Francis of Assisi, because you can recognize someone who's, who's living the life, which means that um, he didn't think about tomorrow. And I mean, I know that sounds sort of metaphorical or something, but he literally would not think about tomorrow. So there are stories, for instance, where he rebukes the brother who's, in, who's the cook, brother cook, who's making the soup or wants to make the soup for tomorrow by soaking the beans tonight. And he's told, no, absolutely, you don't soak the beans overnight. <laughs> mm -hmm. I guess that means you put beans that are kind of hard in the soup um, or you get some kind of beans that don't have to soak very long and you can soak them for a couple of hours. But his, his vow of poverty was extreme. And it also included, he, he forbade uh, his brothers and sisters and siblings and himself to even touch coin. Um, coin and sort of cash economy was brand new in those days. It, that, it did exist and he wanted nothing to do with it. And a friar was not supposed to even touch money. Mm -hmm. But you can imagine how difficult that would be then to grow uh, an institution. Um, mm -hmm. So, I mean, Francis had no interest in growing a monastery. He didn't want those thick walls of security. Um, he didn't really want the community that you know, praise the hours and sings in choir every day. Uh, he didn't want the schooling that is provided in a monastery. And he clearly, as I mentioned before, did not have parents who were looking to send him there because it's what good, you know, Catholic parents do because it gives you brownie points in heaven. So he wanted to live a peripatetic troubadour, uh, wandering around the countryside life of of doing good deeds and uh, preaching, which in, in his case often meant juggling and singing and entertaining for people and uh, trying to show people a way towards joy in their lives. Mm -hmm. um, and he wanted to do that without building institutions. But there's a way in which the, the story of Francis is not a complete one unless you unless you take it all the way to the end, to his death, which was in 1226. And in the six or seven years before his death, you see him losing control of his order that he had founded because he had been away for a year uh, in Egypt, in the Nile Delta area. And when he came back, he had lost control. They thought he was dead. Um, some of them might have hoped he was dead. I don't know, because they wanted to change things. They wanted to make it into a religious order that made sense, mm -hmm. that built schools and that built houses and, you know, maybe built really good things like hospitals and stuff. Yeah. Francis was all about, you know, um, caring for the leper. He just didn't want to build a hospital. So he then lost control. And then the Franciscan order very quickly became uh, uh, sort of codified and organized in a way that it then no longer was uh, distinctive, really, from Dominicans and Benedictines and so on. Um, but that's that's part of the story of Francis. That's part of that's part of the appeal of him, the idealism and the severity. I mean, there's a way in which uh, people who have a religious impulse uh, are drawn to that kind of a seriousness of a character. I mean, there's nothing fluffy about him. There's nothing fake about him. But then. Part of that character is also that I'm sure he was a pain in the neck. I mean, I'm sure, I'm sure, he, I'm sure he drove his friends crazy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and also in terms of, I mean, responding to a religious call. At some point, stability is good uh, for a spiritual development, probably, right? Yes. I mean, sometimes you have to rest or stay in the same place for a few days, and yeah. of course, yeah. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned uh, his journey to Egypt, and in the book, you um, 
you talk about his encounter with the Sultan. Uh, over the years, I've seen many different interpretations uh, of what happened there. Um, some kind of positioning him as a pioneer of interfaith dialogue. Uh, some even saying that he was really a secret Sufi. Um, and that, you know, the way that the Franciscan order was structured as a result resembled, you know, how Sufis organized in Egypt. Um, what I'm interested in here is your take on that encounter uh, in the light of, you know, things like colonialism and the spread of Christianity to, you know, from, from the West to, 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 to other parts of the world or the spread of European uh, culture. Um, could you could you talk about that? Yeah, I think I think to to see Francis sort of to see him correctly in that situation, you have to see him again. I'm going to I'm going to invoke Gandhi a little bit. I mean, you almost have to see the the sandaled Gandhi with his simple cowl getting out of the the fancy Lincoln Continental or whatever it was in London going to see the King of England. And it was because they insisted on driving him. He wanted mm -hmm. to walk, they insisted on driving him. But you see him getting out of that car, going to sit with the King of England. That's what Francis looked like when he was asked to go see a bishop or a cardinal or a pope. And he was asked occasionally to do that because he didn't on his own seem to have a whole lot of interest in going to see mm -hmm. those people because he had a real independent streak about him. Um, I mean, an interesting thing is that the Franciscan and the Dominican orders grew at exactly the same time. Francis and Dominic were exact contemporaries. And Dominic was always on the road to Rome. You know, he was always on the road to Rome to go and ask for permission to do something or to see if a cardinal would supervise some initiative that he wanted to begin or whatever. Francis was never on the road to Rome. It was better just not to ask and do your thing. And he felt pretty good and pretty confident about doing his thing. He wrote a spiritual autobiography called The Testament right towards the end of his life. And he makes some statements in there that um, you know, only God was the one telling me what I should do. I mean, there was really no mention of his priest or his bishop or, mm -hmm. or even much about the sacraments or things like that. I mean, those things were there in his life, but he kind of went, he kind of went it on his own. So I think you have to see him in that light a little bit. And I think you also have to see him in the light of being someone who always seemed to understand the other, the outsider. Um, the person who's forgotten, the person who doesn't have a father, the person whose you know, siblings rejected them. You have to see him as that kind of a figure because his whole life he was reaching out to those people. He seemed to sort of intuitively understand those people. And, and there was no greater you know, other or outsider in the you know, 12th and 13th centuries in Europe and on the outskirts of Europe and what was called you know, the Holy Land than the Muslim. And so to go to the Nile Delta during the height of the Crusades, I mean, the Fifth Crusade was in process. And he and a fellow friar walked across the, the lines, walked past the, the troops that had amassed, the Christian troops that had amassed and were sitting there preparing for the next battle. And they, you know, they sort of beat them up. I mean, they, they, uh, they kicked them and they, they you know, they, they punched him and they pushed him and they had no idea why he would be there. I mean, there was no reason to have a conversation with the Sultan. Uh, the Sultan was someone to kill. You know, the Sultan was someone to, to get him to submit. So what was Francis doing? I mean, what was there to, to discuss? Uh, and he wasn't there on behalf of anyone. He just got it in his head that this was a good idea. I mean, this is one of those ways in which he was so far ahead of his time. Um, so what happened though, in their meeting, I mean, nothing happened, nothing historically happened. You know, there's no, there's no written account. There's no joint statement. There's no press conference. There's no, you know, there's nothing. There's, they met together, they spent time together. But I think what happened was that the Sultan had for the very first time met 
someone who called themselves a follower of Jesus who, who didn't want to kill him, who wanted to understand him, who wanted to meet him. So, I mean, those of us who do have an interest in interfaith dialogue and understanding between the religions, um, we look to Francis as a pioneer because he was, you know, he was in that way. But, but I think he only was because of that, that, uh, that extreme uh, poverty, that countercultural poverty of his, and that way that he went through the world looking for the vulnerable, looking for those who uh, have been have been rejected, because um, he was so good at that, and it's just where his heart was. Mm -hmm. Thank you, John. Uh, you mentioned bishops and cardinals in in this response, and uh, right now we have a pope, uh, the Bishop of Rome, who. Uh, is called Francis and who really kind of models his ministry on the example of St. Francis of Assisi. In chapter six, um, uh, called Walk Lightly on the Ground, you kind of talk a little bit about ecology and Pope Francis. Um, I'm curious about how do you see that connection between Pope Francis and St. Francis? And I know that there are at least two books that I'm aware of that were written on that, but I'm curious about your own personal take on it as a Catholic and also as someone who is following in the footsteps of St. Francis in your own spiritual life. Well, I, I love this aspect of St. Francis because it's the aspect that I think really draws people who are outside of the Christian tradition as well. I mean, mm -hmm. you might be like me in that, I mean, I know atheists who think that Francis of Assisi is their favorite saint and they'll actually say, say it in that way. Um, I have Buddhist friends who have said the same thing. I have Jewish friends who have said the same thing. Yeah. Um, and then there, there's the same kind of reaction to Pope Francis. I mean, there's never been a pope who has who has drawn so much interest from people outside of the Christian community, perhaps because they're they, they have this hope that, you know, finally, there's a there's a pope who can break through in a way that can make some real and serious and lasting change that reflects Vatican II, which is so long overdue. And I think Pope Francis has been doing a lot of that. Um, there's a there's a long way to go. Um, but, you know, there's a really good reason why a pope had never taken the name Francis before. Yeah. Uh, it's pretty hard to imagine um, following truly in those steps. And I don't think anybody has thought this since Pope Francis took the name back in 2013 and they, and they only for two or three days watched what he did with it. But at the very beginning, I would, I would imagine that some people probably thought, um, how arrogant, you know, to assume that you could follow in those footsteps. But right away, I think he showed us that he had the sort of humility and meekness and uh, vulnerability in mind precisely and going to the margins, the way that Francis of Assisi went to the margins to meet people, to see people, to find people, but also lived on the margins. And I mean, has there been, uh, there hasn't been a time in the last hundred years when the Catholic Church, for instance, has been more on the margins in this country. And in Europe, maybe it's the last thousand years, there hasn't been a time when the church was more on the margins of society, um, of culture, of influence. The Supreme Court, maybe we have to leave that as, a, as an exception to, to the rule of what I'm saying. But mm -hmm. uh, there are so many people in the Catholic Church who still spend way too much time trying to figure out how to get that position and that power back. Mm -hmm. But I think what Pope Francis and what Francis of Assisi both uh, tell us is to be comfortable in the margins because that's where we're supposed to be anyway. And you know, Pope Francis has been all about that, you know, that, that unless we are living on the margins, unless we are are finding those on the margins and aligning ourselves with them instead of with the powerful, then we're not doing what we're supposed to be doing. So yeah. I mean, that's, I think that's my best answer. Yeah, and I mean, this connects beautifully to, to a statement that you have in the book um, where you say, unlike St. Paul, St. Francis didn't have visions of Christ on the road, but what he, um, you know, 
who he met uh, on the road, uh, he welcomed and he met uh, the wolf, he met bandits, he met lepers, and he welcomed them. Uh, yeah. and, and I think in a way, I mean, what inspires me about Pope Francis is this whole idea of the church being kind of like a um, field hospital, uh, yeah. where those who are hurt by the realities of life uh, can come in and where their wounds can be can be addressed. Um, that to me is just, I, I think the best image, you know, or metaphor for the church that, that I've ever seen, you know? Yeah. Well, and of course, I mean, you, you were alluding to the, you know, the ecological yeah. concerns of both Pope Francis and St. Francis and Laudato Si, you know, the encyclical that Pope Francis wrote, which is an extended uh, reflection on, on some key writings of Francis of Assisi. And, you know, climate change finally being addressed, um, at least from the head of the Catholic Church and begging leaders of the world to do the same. What, what I try to pull out in this book, in Feed the Wolf, is that the radicalness of Francis's commitment to uh, understanding himself as a creature among many creatures and not the dominant one and talking about Mother Earth and the reverence that we should have for her, that I'm surprised it didn't make him a heretic in his own day 800 years ago. Yeah. I mean, that, there was no one teaching that in seminary. Yeah. You know, there was no one teaching that in religious schools. There were no monasteries that had, there were no catechism classes that, that taught you to do the things that Francis then went around doing and teaching. Like, uh, you know, he would, tell, he would tell his brothers, if you have to cut some firewood, just cut part of the tree so the rest of the tree can grow. Or he would tell the brothers who planted vegetable gardens, um, you have to leave a strip in the garden at least for wild grasses and wild flowers so that they can they can grow and we can see their joy and experience their joy mm -hmm. and I mean, he even he even walked reverently over rocks um i mean he's he's buddhist i mean you you said earlier he was sufi i mean i think i think you know there's a way in which um uh these behaviors must have just shocked people yeah, and, and and then he you know he did things that kids do that I did when I was a kid, and then sadly we, we outgrow them. Where he yeah. there are stories of him uh, in rainstorms picking up the worms from the from yeah. the the places where they come up out of their holes onto the rocks of the streets and putting them back into the grass and um, and going out to meet the wolf. You know, I mean he 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 embraced Mother Earth and himself as a creature, uh, had no interest in dominating. Uh, uh, the world around him. I mean, I think this just shows how deep of a mystical, if you will, insight he had into the interconnectedness of all life. Um, you know, in one of the kind of later chapters, uh, the chapter called Make a Big Table and Invite Your Neighbors, um, you mention uh, the Vietnamese uh, Zen Buddhist teacher Thich Nhat Hanh and this idea that he really pioneered that, you know, the future Buddha um, will not be a person, but rather uh, it will be a community. Um, and he also developed this term interbeing. And I think in many ways, I mean, that is the Francis's teaching, right? Yeah. Yeah, well, and you know, my favorite story about Thich Nhat Hanh is, is the one where Thomas Merton meets him when he was a, still a relatively young monk, not Merton, but Nhat Hanh. And, mm -hmm. uh, and he asks him, what did you learn in your first couple of years in the monastery? And I'm sure he was expecting an answer of Buddhist philosophy because Merton loved to talk about those kinds of things with mm -hmm. And uh, Nahan's response was how to open and close doors quietly, um, yeah. which must, much of, must have just knocked Merton off his feet. But it's the same idea with Francis. I don't remember if I tell that story in the book, but it's the same idea with Francis that 
I, I'm convinced, and, and I know there are a few occasions in Feed the Wolf where I bring in indigenous voices mm -hmm. and I compare Francis to indigenous voices and people because there's a way in which I think it helps to understand him that he, he thought, he, it's pretty clear that he thought there was a direct correlation between unconverted life and unconverted life and a kind of rough living that there was a gentleness, a sensitiveness, a vulnerability, um, a, uh, a lot of use of touch, um, uh, senses that are devalued often by, you know, sort of philosophical, theological folks. Um, he, he, was a, he was a deeply rooted person, um, yes, in the community, the future Buddha, um, but also in in the community as he as he saw it which included all all of the creatures around him mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. beautiful so i'm wondering i mean i feel like we could talk the whole night uh, do, do we have anyone asking questions I yes have so we have um a very interesting question uh from an anonymous attendee uh, who just praises, you know, uh, this book and how wonderful uh, it is. Um, uh, and that your book really humanized Francis for this person uh, for the first time in 41 years. Uh, and I think, John, that that is your gift. I mean, you really make him alive. Um, so, so thank you for that. But now getting to the question part of this, um, uh, this person is asking who has written about Claire uh, as thoroughly and thoughtfully as John has about Francis. Who would you recommend we read about Claire? Is it even possible to write as extensively about Claire as it is, um, you know, about Francis? Well. I'm not sure it is possible to write as clearly about. I that. was thinking maybe that could be your other book on Franciscan spirituality. <laughs> well, I I have written some. I mean, we mentioned that book earlier that earlier that you said you enjoyed, which is called Francis and Claire. Uh, what's it called? Francis and Claire. A it's like a dual biography. I don't remember the subtitle, but the, I know the title is Francis and Claire. Yeah, that's the one that I love. Um, a couple of other books come to mind. Uh, Wendy Murray wrote a book on Claire of Assisi maybe a year, year and a half ago, which is a good book, um, a sort of straight biography of Claire, mm -hmm. and probably shares about as much as we really can know about her. And there's also a beautiful book, which I'm quite sure is out of print by Murray Bodo. Some people who are watching who who know Franciscan spiritual literature will remember and appreciate the name Mur Father Murray Bodo, B-O-D-O, who has written many, many books. He's a poet. Uh, he's a retreat leader on retreats to Assisi, still is probably even though he's in his 80s, and has a beautiful book that's probably out of print on Claire. And I think the title is just Claire. And I don't remember what the subtitle is. It's a little book, but it's a beautiful book. And then another thing I'll mention, the last thing I'll mention is that there's a, there's a publisher called New City Press in, uh, in New York State. And they're the ones who publish a lot of the primary texts on, the, on early Franciscanism. And they have a volume also in the same sort of series, which is all devoted to Claire and all the early texts about Claire. And so for, if someone's really interested in diving into Claire, it's, it's a little bit more of an academic book. But you you would get a lot to uh, busy yourself with in that one. Great, thank you for that. Oh, I should have added though the, the the reason why we probably can't know quite as much about Claire is because she had to be cloistered. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, one of the sadnesses I think about the early Franciscan movement is that when Claire went to join the fellas, it was on Palm Sunday, the year twelve twelve, in the middle of the night. She, she flees her family home, goes down into the valley where these ragtag guys are doing things that people still think is a little bizarre. They haven't quite figured out what's going on with Francis and the guys who are down there. And she just, she wants to join them. She wants to do what they're doing. She doesn't understand why a woman can't do that. And, and what I'm getting to is that the sad thing is that that night 
Francis called her a brother. I don't think we had the word sibling quite then that we could have, you know, to, to call it uh, mm-hmm. in the 21st century. But he called her brother because he didn't know what else to call her. She was just one of them. Mm-hmm. She was with them and she wanted to be with them. And I think there was a day or two days or we don't really know. Three days. Was it a week when Claire was with them and doing what they did? But then they kind of quickly realized that with women in the year 1212, they couldn't pull this off yet. They could not pull off having men and women together, traveling around, living under the stars, um, um, hanging out with the farmers in the fields and then singing and dancing. And, you know, this wasn't uh, the 20th century or the 21st century, it was the early 13th century. And so they put Claire, obviously with Claire's, you know, permission, Claire then becomes the founder co-founder with Francis of the second order in order for women, but it meant that they had to go behind essentially a metal grill and be cloistered. And so as a result, we don't know much about Claire. Thank you. And uh, we have a couple of other questions. Uh, One from Paula, which is when you do your research about St. Francis, how do you sift through the stories that may not be true and the ones that are? Well, we have a little bit of help with that by comparing the stories in one early text with the stories in another early text and trying to get a sense for which ones uh, seem to be authentic based upon you know, some of the techniques that you use, um, regardless of, of what topic you're dealing with in literature that is in many respects sort of prehistorical. Mm-hmm. So there are some tools and some helps to do that. And there's also a bit of a consensus that has built up over the last hundred years, in particular when Franciscan studies really got galvanized about a hundred years ago or 140 years ago. But of course, you know, if I'm honest, I'll say I also tell the stories that I like. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know? I mean, there are some stories that I don't go out of my way to tell. I mean. I was just giving a talk a couple of nights ago and somebody at the end of the talk asked me about the stigmata. You know, I mean, it's one of the things that people know about Francis that he was the first one ever, right? And, yeah. and um, I never go out of my way to incorporate that usually into a talk that I'm giving about Francis because I don't think it's all that important. And that might sound, that might sound awful to, um, to someone listening, but I don't think it's all that important because Francis never said a word about it. I mean, um, it wasn't something that he felt the need to comment on. It wasn't something that he ever made part of his own story. So I would just be speculating if I made it part of his story. Mm-hmm. So, I, you know, if I'm being honest, I would say that I also tell the stories that I like. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, another question from Marcel. Uh, is it fair to say that Claire chose her siblings too? Well, she certainly chose her siblings that first night when, you know, she arrived down in the valley and they, you know, she cut her hair. She, she decided I'm not going to get married and that's why I'm leaving the family home and that's why I'm doing it in the middle of the night. And her uncles arrived later that evening and physically tried to drag her away in what seems to be a, an awfully violent scene and did not succeed somehow. Um, so it was, um, it, was a, it was a dramatic gesture and it was a, a hugely courageous thing. And she was choosing her siblings. She was choosing one life over another. But when she ended up you know, in the second order and she ended up in San Damiano and she was essentially uh, a nun when that's not quite what she had bargained for, um, she then built it into a beautiful life. But I'm not sure if you could say that she chose her siblings in quite the same way because uh, it was a different kind of a life. Interestingly, by the way, some people might be interested to know that one of her sisters then quickly joined her. And then later her mother actually came and joined her. So it's almost, it's a different kind of story than Francis. Francis who had this rift with his parents that was never healed. And we know nothing about his siblings even though we know he had them. Uh, Claire, has a very different kind of a story when it comes to her family. 
And John, and now maybe last question, and this is a question from me based on a statement from your book uh, in the chapter, Begin to Dance, uh, um, which says, anyone who talks about God without singing or dancing will have a very dry mouth, something to that effect. <laughs> I just loved that. Can you speak about that in this sense of joy in Franciscan spirituality? Yeah, I, I, I think it, it's almost hard to get at. It's hard to explain. You know, it's, it's something that people sometimes, I hope, get a chance to experience that kind of joy. I mean, joy, even if you try and define joy, I mean, what is joy? Joy is probably any emotion that is truly felt and experienced. I mean, um, Francis... Francis knew how to get to that place and he knew how to help people get to that place. Um, I, he suffered a lot in his life. We haven't talked about that tonight, but his mm -hmm. life was full of a lot of suffering. Mm -hmm. But even in those moments, he was, he was able to uh, access a different side of what was going on in his life and a different side of the emotion. And he was able to, to be in a place of joy. And, and he sang and danced, dan danced literally. You know, he, it was an early Franciscan who first said, um, it shouldn't be uh, the devil who has all the best music. You know, I mean. I love that. <laughs> it, was an, it was an early Franciscan who said that seven, 800 years ago. And Francis, you know, long before Martin Luther was taking German uh, pub tunes and turning them into uh, hy hymns for the German hymnal. Francis was doing the same thing with early ver vernacular Italian and mm -hmm. writing poems, poem and song, you know, meaning the same thing to Mother Earth and singing them and making sure that all of his siblings sang along with him. Um, and as I said before, preaching was basically entertainment. So um, yeah, he, he was he was really good at joy. And I think, uh, geez, we need more of that, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Joy is the power. <laughs> well, thank you so much for this conversation. It's, it's really wonderful to, to learn from you. And this book is, I just loved it. I just finished it actually earlier today, you know, as I was preparing for this. And it was such a joy to... Uh, to, to, to read it and also, um, I, I, I mean, you know, just even the titles, you know, Pray with the Moon, Find Your Courage, uh, Be a Mother, Begin to Dance. I, I think that this book is exactly what we need right now, you know. Oh, thank you. Oh, we should have talked about Be a Mother. I like Be a Mother very yeah. much, but people can read that. Yeah. It has been a joy to have you both tonight. And um, we are um, honored to be part of this event. So um, thank you both. Uh, much success to both of you. Um, I'm sure, um, John, that I will see you soon in the store. And hope to thank see you. a lot of you as well. Um, thank you. We wouldn't have a bookstore without you. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you, Boswell Book Company. Thank you, Adam. Thank you. Good night. All right. Ciao.